I am by no means an expert in this at all, but I am definitely passionate about this. I very much love just learning about history of South Carolina from the beginning because that's how we were started. So let's get started. So, as you may have may know from history, South Carolina was certainly not off to a rocky start from the very beginning. Y'all are gonna have to bear with me here. I have not actually done a Zoom program. <laughs> there we go. So, South Carolina was first um, inhabited by the Native Americans and living about 14,000 years ago or so. There's always new research and there were 30 tribes here. Among them, ma the main ones in South Carolina were the Catawba, the Cherokee, and the Yemisee. The Catawba were about your counting area, the Yemisee were Beaufort, and the Cherokee were more the upstate area. And so they were able to really get along at first with the Europeans, and they taught our early settlers how to grow crops successfully and which plants could be used as medicine. So, and then eventually they did, as you can tell from this picture, they adopted European customs and that gave them a greater chance of survival. And, but unfortunately, the Europeans did bring not only goods with them to trade, but also diseases such as smallpox. And so within a hundred years of European settlement, the Native Americans were nearly wiped out. So first, you may always associate the settling of South Carolina with the English, but it was the Spanish started coming here. And then they, so they came here and, but they didn't always get along with each other or with Native Americans. So they, they were wrought with, um, both with frustration here and so decided to shift their focus to Sp to Florida at the time, just as a different, um, category and getting away from these Native American groups. So then the French tried to come and they were seeking religious freedom. And so they settled at Port Royal, which is ne near present day Beaufort. So everything appeared to be good. They were getting along with the Native Americans and they, the Native Americans were friendly in helping them out because the French did not plant any crops and so I'm not really sure how they thought they were going to survive but they ended up so they ended up just abandoning their fort and just leaving and so of course most of them died the Spanish then came back, but only to fight with the French that remained, and then they went back on to Florida. So the English came, and they found the land favorable for growing crops and everything, but then because the French had well-established uh, settlements in the north, 
they never really met, came here to South Carolina. So it was about a hundred years before they actually came down and settled South Carolina. When they did, it was the Lord Proprietor's eight friends of the King of England at the time came. And in 1663, they were given this land, the Providence of Carolina, that if y'all notice from this map, goes from the Atlantic Ocean essentially to the West Coast. And it encompassed uh, North Carolina, Georgia, and some of Florida, and Alabama, Mississippi. So it was not just the South Carolina as we think today. Now, these proprietors were supposed to build settlements, collect taxes, and organize armies. So this was off to an interesting start. I've got a quote here, and you'll recognize the name. It's from Captain William Hilton, describing what he saw when exploring the coast in 1663. We return viewing the land on both sides of the river and found good tracts of land, dry, well wooded, pleasant, and delightful as we have seen anywhere in the world. And so that really does describe, and these are the eight men. If you notice, you'll kind of recognize some of their names because. Lord Anthony Ashley Cooper, we of course have the Cooper River, Ashley River. We have Berkeley County and among other things. So they were able to come here. And, but the one thing is they never actually set foot here in South Carolina. They sent representatives. So the colonies, the colonists really got irritated with them. But we'll get to that in a minute. So in 1670, there were a hundred English settlers that came to Charleston. And, and by 1680, the population had risen to a thousand, so they were forced to move. So on the map, you'll see the blue, this was the best map I could find. The blue dot shows Charlestown Landing, and that's where the original settlement would have been. And then it's about 25 miles inland on the Ashley River and then present day Charleston. And because Charleston, they picked it mainly because it was better for trade. It was better to uh, defend from Native American or pirate attacks. But in 1698, Charleston faced a devastating year. They were nearly wiped out by fire, a hurricane, and a smallpox epidemic. And the next year, there was a yellow fever epidemic. So they were lucky. Charleston is still there today and is the oldest city in South Carolina. So I talked about some wars with and conflicts with the Native Americans. Chief among them was the Yemassee War from 1715 to 1717 down in, near Beaufort area. And then other tribes get, got involved. And here comes the proprietors that they did not do, really do anything. 
or at least they tried, but the colonists refused to listen. And so the Native Americans ended up killing at least 90 settlers at first. But then um, within those next two years, over 400 settlers were uh, killed and then cultivated land was destroyed. The good, good news for the settlers though, I guess, was that the Yemisee were run out of South Carolina into Spanish Florida, where they would later join up with other Native American tribes and form the Seminole Indians. So another thing, reason I mentioned with moving uh, the city of Charleston to its present day location was pirates. And so y'all may recognize the gentleman here on the uh, screen with the black beard. This was Earl Tech, or Edward Tech, aka Blackbeard. And what he often did to make himself even look more fierce was he put lit matches in his beard. And so he came to Charlestown in 1718 and looting ships and taking hostages. And normal things you would think pirates would do, except this was a little different mission. For some reason, they wanted medical supplies, didn't necessarily want the silver and gold, which they did get some, but after, so they were seeking the medical supplies. They were, it took six days before the colonists actually agreed to give the supplies. And then the pirates just left without a shot being fired. So, the not all pirates were what they seemed. Women often became pirates. If you'll remember in uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, the female lead did join the pirates. Well, this is was kind of a similar story, I guess, in South Carolina with Anne Bonnie. She was from Ireland, but had lived in South Carolina most of her life. And so it was the quote unquote typical love story when she fell for a pirate and decided to go join him on his raids on the high seas. Well, that did not seem to work out in their favor because things go awry, as they often did, and the crew was caught um, by the authorities, and the men were immediately hanged, and the women, there were two women with them, but because they were pregnant, they were just put in prison. And one of the women, she, she died about a year later in prison. And, but Anne Bonnie did survive and she was released and came back to live in Charleston. And then she later married and had more children. Okay, so. 1729, South Carolina became a royal colony. So not as simple as you might think. So after the North and South Carolina split in 1712 and became two separate colonies, they were largely 
able to govern themselves. But then, and the proprietors were still in place and they, they were not doing a wonderful job. Remember how I said they had never come here? Well, it's a little hard to rule if you are 3,000 miles away. So the colonists voiced their displeasure and the King of England at the time made them a royal colony because South Carolina was valuable for it their natural resources. So you might think this chair is rather odd. Here, it, um, and it's large, like a throne. And you can see it on display currently at the South Carolina State Museum. It's owned by the McKissick Museum at, with the University of South Carolina. But it was, at that time, the royal governor really did want this to be like a throne and it was kind of put up on a pedestal so it would have had a small footstool with it. Not only that, they did wear bigger, baggier clothes, several layers of clothing then. And so that could be another reason they needed big chair. But I guess we'll never really know. So South Carolina is known for cash crops. And it was all in thanks to the Native Americans that the colonists were even able to grow crops here. So they grew corn and tobacco, but then they discovered rice worked well here in the hot, humid climate. And we certainly have the hot, humid climate. Now, my research also said wet climate. I want to know if it rained more back then, because it certainly, we need it now, but it doesn't appear to be coming anytime soon. So in 1720, planters grew more rice than they grew about 20 million pounds of rice each year. And because they did this, they discovered they needed to have more labor in the fields, and that's where the African slave trade came into play. So, what, one of our most famous crops here in South Carolina is indigo with a, from Eliza Lucas Pinckney. So it was blue dye up until this time was normally only made in Asia. So the richest people really only had blue clothing. And if you notice today, this outfit, not only is blue my favorite color, but this outfit works perfectly with indigo blue being on it. So, and then you'll notice the flag behind me. The South Carolina state flag is indigo blue. So how did indigo, was indigo produced? Well, I will tell you it is not an easy process at all. And you would normally think that it would the color would come from the pretty blue flowers. No, it actually comes from the leaves and it through a fermentation process, which is very complicated. I'd be here all day trying to describe it. So you get this powdery blue substance and that's how you make the dye. 
or you can take the 20th century way out and just go buy red dye at the store. And it does come in indigo. So that's just a little fun fact there. So life as a colonist was very, very different here in South Carolina. It was one of the fastest growing colonies in the original 13 colonies, with most people coming from England, France, Germany, Ireland, or Scotland. So they um, were no longer forced to buy the European goods because of this influx of population because there were several merchants in this. And so they were not forced to buy from England. So the wealthy families tended to live down near Charleston and this picture on our screen is Drayton Hall if any of y'all have ever visited, it is one of the few remaining buildings from the uh, Revolutionary War period in colonial times. And I've not been there yet, but it certainly looks inviting. And so they tended to have the large plantations mainly in the uh, round Charleston area. Usually they would live outside the city, but they would also own a home in downtown Charleston. So they could go there during the winter months, typically. And families, the wealthy families would have their servants or their enslaved Africans uh, look after the children who, who were often taught by tutors and then sent to England for university. A lot of the wealthy would participate in entertainment and dances like this. But then on the other side you have the simple life of those families that weren't quite as wealthy. And these families did not tend to live down in Charleston. They were more of the frontier and farm families in the up, what now is called upstate. So up near 96 in Greenwood area. So all these families, as opposed to the wealthy families, everybody in the family worked on the farm. Boys worked alongside their fathers because these families were not wealthy enough to have servants. So they really needed to work Every, everybody needed to take part, even the young children. So now we're getting into the part where I absolutely could go on for days. <laughs> so the road to the Revolutionary War, the French and Indian War took place prior to the um, colonies here getting into the revolution. The French Indian War was actually a main reason why we had the American Revolution because Britain felt like because they had come over and protected us against the French and the Indians that we as colonists of Great Britain should pay 
So we, um, so they started enacting these acts. Well, starting off with the Sugar Act of 1764 that really did not have an impact on South Carolina because we were not involved in the sugar trade here. But then once the Stamp Act came along, it was more of a direct act and that did affect all colonists because a stamp had to be placed on everything. Now I'm going to attempt to uh, stop this to show y'all even, I mean, all paper documents, even playing cards had to have a stamp on them. And this is a deck of playing cards that I actually purchased from William, Colonial Williamsburg. Okay, now let's see if I can do this again. It, th this is working. Okay, so then of course, we've all heard of the famous Tea Act of 1773 and the Boston Tea Party, where the colonists got together and threw tea overboard in the Charleston Harbor. Well, South Carolina had their own tea party here. It's not as well known or talked about, but and not, not quite as eventful, but the um, merchants who had actually brought the tea in to the harbor were ordered to dump the chest of tea into the harbor. And uh, I've got a quote here from the South Carolina Gazette saying three hearty cheers after the emptying of each chest. Now, mind you, there were only like six chests, but it still had an impact here in South Carolina. So, most of the revolution up until up at this point was up north until South, South Carolina did see a piece of it. There, there we go. So we have the Battle of Sullivan's Island and if you notice that date, that was actually one week before we officially declared independence from Great Britain. So the British thought that they could come and conquer South Carolina. Well, they, because they had the most powerful Navy at this point. So, uh, a, the, uh, William Moultrie got some men together, most of them enslaved people, to build a fort at Sullivan's Island that out of palmetto logs and sand. Well, just because that happened to be what was on the island at the time, Little did they know that that would help out in this circumstance. So they only completed about half of the fort before the British arrived. And the British had planned out a strategy. They were going to, some land troops were going to cross. Well, they ended up not being able to because the water was too deep for them. Then another ship that was supposed to sell, sell uh, ran aground. And so the remaining ships were forced to sail directly in front of 
before in the American guns. So, uh, what, and then in essence, so they were um, sending targets just right there in front. A fight ensued, but the, remember the fort was made out of palmetto logs, which think about celery, how it's very spongy and um, you have all the different strings of the celery. Well, that's kind of like a palmetto log. Is so the cannonballs would often ba either bounce off the logs to the dismay of the British, or they they would just kind of sink in, but not explode or anything. And so brave Americans would actually go and get the cannonballs and put them back in the American guns and fire them at the British. So this was the earliest form of recycling and green warfare that I know of. So when you think of the Battle of Salt Buns Island, you really think about the flag and William Jasper saving the flag. But that was not one of the, the, the true hero of this was the Palmetto Log Fort. So there, there's a lot to the American Revolution to end South Carolina, but we're just gonna quickly go over what needs to be discussed here. So we've got the Siege of Charlestown in 1780. Now remember the Battle of Sullivan Island was 1776. So we've skipped ahead to 1780. The British, because of their awful defeat at Sullivan Island, later named Fort Moultrie, was so so devastating of a blow that they did not even come back south until they really needed to. Once France and Spain joined the American Revolution as the on the side of the Americans, did Britain they were forced to change their strategy and decided to come down south. And they thought it was going to be easy down here. Well, they were going to be proven mistaken. But at the Siege of Charleston, it really, um, it was a, two, about two months before, and the British would surround the city and kind of strangled the city like a snake strangles its prey. And um, that is a hard analogy for me, but it works. Um, so then we have the Waxhaw's Massacre of May 29th, 1780. Now, Y'all may have heard of the Nashville Talton and uh, his court, his refusing to allow quarter to the Americans. So I've got a quote here, and I I've done extensive research on Talton. So this is a letter he wrote in to Buford to surrender. He said, if you are rash enough to reject them, the blood be upon your head. Gotta say that is one of my favorite quotes. And if y'all want to read more about Talton, I highly recommend this book, Brutal Virtue, 
by my good friend, Anthony Scotting, who's a professor at Midlands Tech University, or college. So let's go back to this, share screen again. I'm, I might be getting the hang of this show. Don't get too excited. Um, <laughs> So, it, and then it looked like there was going to be kind of a stalemate here. The Americans might have a chance, but then came the Battle of Camden, which was a very embarrassing defeat for the Patriots. Of course, the Patriots at this point were very ill and uh, led by Horatio Gates, who was not necessarily the best one to lead the militia at this point. So what, what Gates did, it was, became very clear very early that the Americans were going to lose well, Gaines left the field riding very fast upon his horse and not stopping until he reached Charlotte. And so, unfortunately for Gates, he did lose his job after this, but we got an even better leader in Nathaniel Green. But back to really South Carolina at the time, it was a common practice in European warfare to fight just in an open field, one, one army in front of the other one. If you've ever seen the Patriot, you know about that's why they did it. I don't know why they felt this was the best cause of action, but thankfully we came across Francis in South Carolina. We had Francis Marion, Thomas Sumter, and Andrew Pickens who introduced guerrilla warfare. And Francis Marion was definitely famous for hiding in swamps and forests. Now, if you go back and look at how he got his nickname of the Swamp Fox, it is accredited to be, have been given to him by the Nashree Talton. So y'all will see this famous painting here of Marion offering sweet potatoes to the British officer went under a tree. Well, here at the relic room, I have discovered that we have a piece of this tree. And this is the actual tree that they have this famous sweet potato dinner under. Now, when our inventory said piece of tree, I was thinking this very small piece of tree, not this big chunk here that looks like they may have chopped down a great bit of this tree. But it's one of the many things we here have at the relic room that uh, Hope, hopefully one day we will have these more on display. So back to our presentation. I, I promise I'm near the end, guys. I know I can get excited about the American Revolution. Okay, now what did I do, Jess? Okay, there we go. So, the 
two of the most famous battles here in South Carolina were the Battle of King Fountain and the Battle of Cowpens. If you visit any American Revolutionary sites, these are the two most that I highly recommend. So remember the European style of warfare was fighting across from each other? Well, that, we took that definitely differently at the Battle of King's Mountain. The British thought, oh, we're going to win this because we have the high ground. Well, that's not what the frontier fighters of the Upper Mountain men had in mind. They knew to hide behind trees and to go up the hill. And so the British were kind of sitting there like just sitting ducks. Now, at the Battle of Cowpens, it is more of an open field, but there was somewhat of a strategy to it. And if y'all would like to learn more about cow fans, I do have another presentation I can give at a later date, and I will be happy to discuss cow pens, but definitely you need to go there. Um, cow pens, their military strategy is even still taught today at West Point as one of the best uses of the military strategy in history. So this was when things really started to turn for the Americans. Uh, Thomas Jefferson famously said that the Battle of Kings Mountain was the turn of the tide of success. And I personally believe that without these two battles, the American Revolution may not have been won in favor of the Americans. So, like I said, we could go on and on for days upon days talking about Revolutionary War history here in South Carolina because over 200 battles and skirmishes were fought here. And some are still, some sites are still being discovered today. So it is a very complicated history. Now, when you usually think about war, you think about the men fighting in the war. But here in South Carolina, a large part of it was fought with the women, including Emily Giger, who was eight, only 18 years old at the time. And she carried a message from General Green to General Sumter across South Carolina through British occupied area, was captured twice, was held at Fort Granby, which is now the Casey Historical Museum, another great place to visit. They have a lot of Emily Giger's um, memorabilia. And because she did make this ride, the Battle of Utah Springs, which became, was the bloodiest battle in the American Revolution, it was the outcome of this famous ride. And it was, the Battle of Utah Springs was actually a draw the Americans said they won, the British said they won. So nobody really knows, it depends on whose research you look at. So, and it wasn't until 1782 that the British troops began evacuating Charleston. And along with them went 
3,800 loyalists here from South Carolina because this was truly a civil war in South Carolina. It was neighbor against neighbor, patriot versus loyalist. There were a lot of loyalists here, which is why Britain thought they couldn't easily get South Carolina. Well, they were mistaken. Uh, so, but it was not until 1783 that the official ending of the American Revolution took place with the Treaty of Paris in 1783. And so, South Carolina had really, because of all these battles, it had been in a state of devastation from all this destroying, towns were destroyed, whole towns. It was properly, property stolen and South Carolina had really bore the brunt of the American Revolution. So we, we finally became a state May 23rd, 1788. And this is when uh, our flag came into play. Now, at the time of the American Revolution, the Palmetto tree was not there. And it, the, this crescent shape was still on there. And it, Oftentimes the flag said just liberty on it, but um, the crescent shape was there. And it is argued it to this day as to whether or not that was, that is a moon or a piece of armor from Europe called a gorget, which they would wear around their neck to protect as a way of protection. And the palmetto tree was added later on to symbolize the victory at Sullivan's Island and the Palmetto Fort. And if, if you notice, I've got the flag hanging behind me with the indigo blue. Indigo has now become our official state color. It became that. The state house passed it in 2008. And so it is our official state color. Okay, well, uh, if nobody has any questions, I guess that about wraps it up for today. Thank you so much, and I hope y'all enjoyed it. And I uh, have a wonderful day.